Welcome to Disney's Four Scores. I'm John Burlingame. This podcast series brings together the most accomplished film and television composers working today and reveals the emotional journeys, inspirations, and unique challenges of their work. Our guest today is Neil Davidge, the English composer responsible for the music of Earth Moods, a five-part National Geographic series airing on Disney Plus beginning April 16th. Welcome, Neil. Good morning or good afternoon, as it is for us here. (laughs) Neil, you're well known as a producer for the band Massive Attack. Just take a second and tell us uh, about your time with the group. Yeah, I started working with Massive Attack, I think it was around 1995. They were working on a track for the Batman Forever soundtrack. And the guys that they were working with couldn't finish the track, so I stepped in. And and we just struck up a a great relationship. And coincidentally, they came from Bristol, which is where I'm from. So, you know, and I'd been bumping into the guys over the years. You know, I'd I'd just I'd been working with a band called DNA. Uh, I don't know if you remember the Suzanne Vega Tom's Diner track. Do 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 do. Yeah. So we we did that. And whilst I was working with them in various studios around Bristol, I'd been bumping into the guys from Massive Attack. And I once I started working with them, yeah, we just became inseparable for for many years. I think I worked with them for about 18 years, all told. Primarily as a producer? As a producer and a writer and as a musician, as a programmer, at times I would even mix. A lot of the time I, I would be the one who would initiate the musical ideas that the guys would then start working with. They're not musicians themselves, uh, they're kind of more lyricists and vocalists. So I would often be tasked with pulling together the, the, the pieces of music and then collaborating with them and, and them editing and me encouraging them to mess around and then bringing in other musicians. But what was it that led you into the world of music for film and TV and games? I think I'd always been very visual anyway. Uh, when I was growing up, I actually used to spend most of my time painting and I actually studied to be a graphic designer. So there's always been a a visual side to the music that I'm making, especially with all the work I did with Massive Attack. It was was very kind of visually led. Most of our conversations were not about music. They were about images. They were about emotions, about settings and juxtapositions of different kind of musical genres and references to films. So it was a very kind of mixed media type band anyway. The first album I did with them was Mezzanine. After that was released, you were hard pressed to actually find a film or a TV show that didn't have a piece of music um, put put in there from from that album. It was incredible, actually. And I'd always been interested in the idea of scoring. And and I actually went to the band and I said, guys, we should be we should be scoring. You know, you see see how people are actually using our music and and not just using our music, but referencing our music within scores so that there are a lot of other composers that were referencing or they probably had a a temp track from a Massive Attack (laughs) album in there. So it was was just seeing how, um, how people were gobbling up what we were doing. And I loved it. I, I love the kind of visual medium I love the juxtaposition of music against that. I love how creative and fun you can be and then what you can say emotionally when, when you've actually put it against pictures. So tell us about Earth Moods, what it is and how you became involved. So the connection came through my agent. He sent over some material that he thought might be useful temp music. Um, and they literally built the whole of the first episode out, out of this out of this music. How would you explain Earth Moods uh, to someone who hadn't seen it or wasn't uh, aware of it? It's a collection of short films. I don't see them so much as episodes. They're more standalone pieces. I like to think of it as as, a, as an installation in your own home. So it's it's like a piece of artwork, a piece of move, moving artwork in your room that has music to accompany it. So we have five films at the moment. The first one is Frozen Calm, the second is Night Lights, the third is Tropical Serenity, 
desert solitude and peaceful patterns. I'm, I'm reading off my list for that. <laughs> and they're all very different, but I think that the purpose of them all is to provide uh, an ambient background for for you. When, when you're at home, you're maybe trying to relax or you're trying to do, uh, you know, uh, write an email to someone. It's not just necessarily something that you would sit down and, and watch although you may do, it is mesmerizing, so it definitely warrants that, but it's the kind of thing that you can have on again and again and again, and you would never get bored of it. I guess you could probably stream from one episode to the next, but each episode has a very different feeling, so you might want to get stuck in the kind of the first episode in these ice scapes because of a particular mood that you're in. It doesn't require you to have conscious attention on it. It doesn't demand that. What it says is that you can tap into this in a very unconscious way. It's just, it's, you know, it surrounds you, it's there visually in front of you and you can absorb it and allow that to lift your mood. I think we should probably tell our listeners who have, perhaps haven't seen it yet that this is purely imagery and music. It's far from the usual documentary series. There are no people, there's no narration, you barely see any wildlife throughout the five episodes. The music is front and center. And I wondered, is that a dream job for a composer? <laughs> um, initially, I thought so. <laughs> uh, yeah, I started re just to realize that the music was going to be s the centerpiece in many ways to this whole thing. It, the narrative of the whole sort of thing would, would depend on the music sort of telling a story. Of course, that's an emotional story, but nonetheless, it needed to have a dynamic. So in many ways, it was far more akin to making an album and then, you know, getting videos made of the tracks than it was to scoring a, a TV series or a film where you're you're sitting behind dialogue and you're, you're just raising up every so often just to make an impression. Did the producers say what they were looking for or were they, they, were, or were they did they just simply fall in love with your particular style in that first episode? Uh, I think we worked hand in hand. They, they would make suggestions and I would make suggestions back. You know, these would be in the form often of pieces of music that I would sketch and send them over to them and they would give me feedback on those. Sometimes they would actually cut these into a bit of a flow themselves. But ultimately, I think they were very trusting of me. Once they felt as though I was on the right path, they were very hands-off and, and let me sort of follow my instincts, I think, because they recognise that uh, it's very important, especially in this situation, that there's an authenticity about the creation of the music and that it really does come from the heart because, you know, you don't have the narration, you don't have the actors on screen to pull you in, you don't have the animals, as you say. So this emotional connection is purely coming from the visuals that you see and the music that you hear. So it's very important that I felt as though I could express myself and, and I think they wanted to, not that they ever said this, but they didn't want to get in the way of that process. It was, you know, it was fantastic working with them. It's, it's by far the, the most enjoyable project I've worked on in, well, kind of probably all my 30 years of making music professionally. <laughs> Wow, that's great to hear. Most composers are complaining <laughs> most of the time. Yeah. I didn't have enough. I didn't have enough time. <laughs> there's no budget. You know that sort of thing. So it's nice to hear well, that. That's was... the project I'm working on now. <laughs> <laughs> Let me ask you: How did you start? I mean, it's interesting for me. For example, the first episode, at least the one that we're watching at home, uh, is Frozen Calm, which is filled with images of snow-capped mountains and pristine snowdrifts. Is that the first one that you started work on? It is, yeah. And yeah. how did you start? How did you figure out what that particular kind of imagery, the glaciers, the ice, the snow, required? Well, something I do a lot when I'm working on, on a project is, is just have the images playing in the background and I'll just be 
freely creating and not really thinking about structure, not thinking about what the picture needs. I'll just be following my instincts and following my gut and just writing music that, f that just feels right for me to write in the moment. And I write a lot in, in, in those, those, those periods of sketching. Um, and it's from there that I can then work through those sketches and listen through to those sketches and send certain ones to wh whoever I'm working with and get their feedback. And then slowly we piece together a kind of a narrative. But I was definitely helped on the first episode because they'd already sort of tempt some of my music into that. It was an important part of the process for them to make sure that my voice fitted with what they were trying to say, you know, that there was a compatibility there. So I had a bit of a start, which, which was great. Some of the other episodes I had to sketch a lot more and sometimes I'd spend a week sketching, send them sort of 20 sketches at the end of that week. And I think there was one particular episode and they did it in a very polite way, but they were like, mm, not so much. <laughs> 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 yeah, I think they were keen each time. This was one of the other challenges of the project is they were keen each time for, for each episode to have its own voice. So obviously when I'm working on a TV series, for instance, you can go into multiple seasons, um, but you're still working from an ethos, an approach. There's a, a style to, to the score, which will evolve over time. But um, you have a starting point with this. I felt as though every three weeks I would be working on a completely new project. The linking thing was the, these were all kind of slow moving images, but stylistically, as far as the music was concerned, Ice is very different to the Nightlights one. So I had to assume different personalities as I was working on these things. Did you feel the music in any way needed to be mellow or perhaps more low key than some of the more boisterous things, shall we say, that you've done in your past? <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I did. It's not to say that there weren't a few moments where I, I just tested the limits. I think that's an important thing to do. And you know, both, both limits as well. It's like, how minimal can I be? Or how, how far can I push this? Can I add some energy to this? Can I add some drums to this? Can I add some, some, some beats? and bass lines and things like that. And I think sometimes because of the images moving so slowly and being so beautiful, it did actually allow me to, to not be so loungy or so completely ambient. I could actually add some rhythm and have some energy to some of these pieces. Were you in any sense trying to describe what you were seeing? Is there a way to create music for ice or music for snow? It, it, or, or didn't that really enter your thinking process? It's always always a part of it. So just the, the choice of instruments is very important. When you're seeing images of cities at night with all the lights, you do start thinking of kind of hip hop beats and stuff like that. So yes, I did choose certain instrumentation to fit with the environments that we were working within on, on that particular episode. For ice, the, the, we, we did a lot of orchestral work and there are kind of glassy pads and sounds that, that I used. Uh, the choice of the instruments really did dictate in many ways the way the music would sound and not so much the way it would feel, but the, the way it would sound. Because I think emotionally, you know, you can say I love you in so many different ways. <laughs> but but in, in terms of fitting with the environment, the, the choice of instrumentation was, was key to the vibe of the music at the end of the day. Disney's Four Scores is brought to you by the Four Scores Playlist, featuring music and interview clips from each composer featured in the podcast series, including Neil Davidge's score for the five-episode National Geographic series, Earth Moods, now streaming exclusively on Disney+. The Four Scores Playlist is available on all major music streaming services. Experience the magic behind the music you love whenever you want.
the second episode, which you've referred to, is Night Lights, and it's the yep. only one that actually focuses on man-made structures, skyscrapers, freeways, bridges, airports. Did this seem like it needed a completely different kind of approach? Yeah, it did. It really did. This was the only one that I sent a load of sketches over to them and they said, mm, no. <laughs> <laughs> there were a few hints within there. That there's a couple of things that I'd sketched out that were closer to the vibe. But they were keen to go in a slightly more urban sort of direction. I, I mean, I was for that one, I did tap into a, a bit of early hip hop is, is in there, but also bits of influences from Burt Bacharach and Stevie Wonder and stuff like that, which I love all that stuff, you know. That's the stuff I used to listen to when I was younger. As do I, sure. Yes, it was a real joy. I was actually driving the other day. I had to take my car down to the garage and my son was in the car and he said, oh, what's on the CD player? So I pressed go and it was it was my reference CD for, for that came on. And, and he absolutely loved it. And it did actually sound really good. Oh, great. And, you know, it, it was an opportunity for me to actually be really loungy for once. I don't normally get to express that side <laughs> of myself. Actually, I really love that. I mean, some of it's kind of jazzy. I don't know if the phrase smooth jazz offends you or offends other people. <laughs> Not at all, no. The thing about music is, I think it's just down to how it connects and what it says to people. You know, the only times I have a problem with the way music is used is when it's used to sell you something that you really don't need. I think when it's just essentially connecting one human with another human, I think it's a fantastic thing. You know, music is one of the few ways in which we get to truly understand how someone else feels. So it's a fantastic way of communicating that. Am I hearing synthesizers at some point in all of this? I'm sort of curious to know how you sort of merged electronic sounds with the traditional sounds of an orchestra. Yeah, there are some. Often I prefer to work with organic sounds. So I might be working with guitars, but I'm treating guitars in such a way that they become these really lush ambient chordal um, sounds. And even with strings, the processing those and, and playing those on a keyboard to produce a very different sound. So it might be taking a string sound, something I, we recorded, and then I'll, I'll slow that down halfway or something like that. So you get this really textural sort of sound that you don't really get to hear very much. It might be just the bow, the kind of shh of the bow on the string. When you pull that down in frequency, that becomes far more dominant uh, a sound and it's a fantastic texture um, so I, I, I love doing that kind of stuff now that's fascinating I did recognize parts of Los Angeles and Sydney in that second episode and I was wondering if the imagery was your sole inspiration or maybe your own visits to some of these locations might have influenced what you were writing I think it always helps to have actually gone to these places I think from visiting LA a few times and just the memories of kind of driving down the coast, you know, getting to Santa Monica and, and hanging out down there. And that kind of enriches my emotional connection to, but I've, I've never been to Iceland. I would love to go to Iceland. <laughs> sure. <laughs> you know, so, so it doesn't always follow. I think just the fact that you see things, the glorious planet that we live on, I want people to really appreciate what we've got before we kind of go too far. <laughs> Episode three is called Tropical Serenity. And I sometimes think this is the one that I will revisit most often, <laughs> as I'd really love to be on those beaches right about now. <laughs> Many people would, uh, yeah. I think there are probably a lot of people that, that are gonna enjoy just putting that on in the background. and putting their sunglasses on and... <laughs> and pretending. <laughs> and delivering them. Yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> what, what was necessary here? Did you need to move in a different direction rhythmically or in terms of percussion to sort of establish what you were looking for? Yeah, I think that was a good start to look at the um, traditional instrumentation that you might find in these places. But, you know, I often try to find a new way to to use the instruments. I thought, okay, steel drums, that might sound like a bit of a cliche, but I managed to find a kind of baritone steel drum, or I think they call them 
tenor steel drums. So they're very kind of low frequency and you get this fantastic kind of belly sort of warm sound. And it's, it's actually quite a relaxing sound if it's played quite lightly, but it's also very cool if you just play simple patterns on it, sort of almost like a bass line. So I really enjoyed taking some of these instruments and trying to play them in a way that it wasn't typical. Touching on some of the musical genres, but, but also knowing that I'm not a Latin musician. So again, I, in the search for authenticity, I have to kind of go, what is it that I find fascinating about these instruments? How can I play it that's slightly different to everyone else? And that's what helps me make that connection for myself. And again, if it's real for me, if, if I enjoy making this music, if I feel impassioned about making this music, I really believe that will then connect to other people who are listening to it. I thought there was like a hint of a samba here or there. I wasn't quite sure. There was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I was listening to some bits. It's, it's one of the things that I, I do for inspiration is, is that I'll go off on walks, especially in kind of pandemic era. I'm working from home a lot these days and I live in a little village just outside of Bristol. And so I go, I go on walks. I need, you know, I've been working in the studio and I, ca I can't see the wood for the trees. So I just go on these walks, put my headphones on, my iPhone on, on random. So just randomly playing bits of music and, you know, there could be a bit of bossa nova would come in, but then a bit of Russian choral music and then a bit of electronic and then a bit of Pink Floyd and, <laughs> <laughs> and it all kind of mixes up. And then I, I come back and I've got all of these different influences flying around my head, you know, which really helps me kind of find an angle, I guess. It's in that episode that we actually see creatures for the first time, dolphins I and know. fish <laughs> and may maybe a manta ray, I'm trying to remember. A turtle in there, I think. Right, right. Did they require attention or were they simply part of the background you were scoring? I think I try to not see them as, as characters. When you're composing for natural history programs, there's a real need to see the animals as people and to score them as people so that we connect with them as, as we're watching these shows on a very human sort of level. But in this instance, I didn't want to get taken with that. They could be swimming through this and it's almost like they were just a visitor, but it's actually, it's the setting it's the, that's, that was the important thing. It's the environment that was important not the, the character on the screen at that point. The fourth show is called Desert Solitude. And in this one, I think I was hearing flutes and maybe some distant vocals. Yes, there were some flutes and there were some vocals. So can you talk about those choices for that particular uh, part of the world? With the flutes, it was for sure. It was, it was about the environment again, you know, just the idea of wind rustling through. It's quite obvious, a wind instrument. And um, I've got a friend who's a fantastic flautist and she works a lot with Peter Gabriel and she's played on many, many film scores as well. But she lives locally to us here and she's got a massive bag of all these really unusual wind instruments. And she brought the whole bag with her one afternoon and we just had a, a laugh with just letting her play through things. I'd scored a bunch of things for her to play, but also encouraging her to improvise and just make noises sometimes. I don't want notation, I just want the sound of the environment. But yes, and, and also some vocals, which actually from my partner. <laughs> oh, please tell us about that. Yes, it's, it's very convenient, actually. I've, I've got an in-house singer, <laughs> literally in my house. <laughs> yeah, and Claire Tchaikovsky, she's not really active these days as, as an artist, but she did release back in the day. She does a lot of vocals for me on projects. So she pretty much sings on everything that I've, I've done. She sang on the Halo 4 score. She's got an incredible voice. It's a fantastic resource to have under the same roof. <laughs> and, and, and why did that seem the right musical choice, the idea of a voice in this episode? Because I could almost hear it in the music that I was making. I think sometimes when you affect the instruments and when you put them through different sounds, through effects, 
I don't know if it's a synesthesia type thing, but I start to hear other sounds that aren't actually there. One of the great things about working on this project is that I had many hours in which I could just sit down and absorb it and not really feel like I'm on a deadline I have to produce by this date. So I was allowed to just to really kind of go down the hole, so to speak. And I could start to hear voices with, within this. But also, I'm actually a singer myself. A long time ago, I had a record deal as a singer-songwriter. I use my voice as a creative instrument. It's certainly part of the way that I compose. Often before I put in a line, I sing it, first of all, to work out what the phrasing should be, how it should feel emotionally. When I'm working with other musicians, I'm always singing the part to them. I don't use my voice a huge amount on the projects that I work on, but I have an affinity for voices. The final episode is titled Peaceful Patterns, and it's the most unusual of all because it's all shots of strangely patterned rock formations and desert dunes and underwater formations. Did that require a different approach than the other four? It did, yeah. I felt as though I needed to use more patterns within the actual music itself and really sort of take that concept and pull it into the music. A lot of the other pieces for the other films, I played not to a click track, so there was no particular tempo. I was very loose in the way that I wrote the pieces. There were many passages where I just would just allow the instrumentation to evolve. This was the first one where I felt as though I needed to have a bit more of a structure to it to highlight the patterns within the images themselves. So tell us about the recordings. I mean, I noticed in the uh, credits that you have both the Prague Philharmonic and a string section from Bristol. The Bristol Ensemble. Yeah, so can you talk a little bit about how you merged what you were doing in the studio with the musicians from outside that you needed? For the most part, all of these pieces, I had already demoed them up before we went to record the parts. So I didn't really have them improvising at all. It was more of, of a compose these pieces, demo these pieces, working with sampled strings. And once we'd actually found the form of the piece, then we actually went and recorded them. The tricky bit with Prague is that we couldn't be there. They locked down and we locked down like a couple of weeks before we were set to record. So we couldn't go over there, but we still managed to do a virtual a remote session. For the stuff that we did in Bristol, we pulled together a, a small ensemble and there's a fantastic concert hall in Bristol. And because there are no gigs, <laughs> There, there, were, there was plenty of time, and so we managed to set up down there and borrowed microphone stands from people, and borrowed music stands, and put together a whole recording rig. And it was fantastic. We, we were all socially distanced. The musicians were all spread out on the stage. Just to see the looks on their faces, by the time we actually got to do those sessions, they were so excited to actually be in a room where they were making music with other people. <laughs> That alone must have made the project worthwhile. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely, yeah. This sort of quiet and sometimes soothing and altogether lovely music strikes me as so far afield from the sort of rock and dance world that you came from. But is it all one sort of grand evolution to you as a composer? Yeah, I mean, there, there are many sides to my musical personality. I'm influenced by so many different forms of music. At the end of the day, it's it's just a medium. I feel like it's more important what I'm trying to say or what collectively the group of us are, are trying to say. That's the really important aspect of it, not so much the particular genre that we're working in. And yeah, I think I've always had a fascination for ambient music. And from time to time within say, working for, for Mass Attack, I would get to explore. The first album that I worked on with them, there were a few pieces that started as, as these really abstract ambient 
workouts that we slowly built upon till they, they became the pieces they were. So that's, that's always been a part of what I love and I often like to jump from one thing to another. If I'm doing something beautiful and ambient, I like to then go and do something really noisy afterwards. <laughs> and will you? What are you on to next? I'm working on a show called Britannia. It's it's about when the Romans invaded Brit- Britain and they encountered all these druids and Celts and, and all this weirdness. There's, there's a lot of drug taking in it. It's a really crazy, <laughs> crazy show. And, and I get to have a lot of fun and make a lot of noise and sometimes do some really beautiful ambient music as well. <laughs> it's a fabulous project and we're so excited to have you talk about it. Thank you so much, Neil. Yeah, I can't wait for people to see it. I really enjoyed it. It's a fantastic thing. Thank you for listening to Four Scores. Please subscribe and make sure to share this episode with your music-loving friends. It would also be great if you could rate it because that really helps others find the series. Check out National Geographic's Earth Moods, now streaming on Disney Plus, and listen to the soundtrack wherever music is enjoyed.